Uh, thank you very, very much for having me here. And, uh, Rivka, you've been a great uh, host and organizer of this whole thing, so I appreciate it. I, um, I'm going to, well, I'm going to do several unusual things today. First of all, I'm going to stay seated, which I don't usually do. I just move around, but I'm told I need to be here. Um, so I will stay here. Um, and uh, I realize that this is a uh, important role I play at the end of the day because I am the only thing between you and the title of my talk. <laughs> um, and um, so I don't know whether I should go slow or quickly. No, um, I will. Um, so the um, text of my talk is actually, um, I didn't quite know what would happen, but I wanted to reflect on this book from 1988 by a philosopher named Henry Fingeret called Heavy Drinking. And the subtitle is The Myth of Alcoholism as a Disease. Now, Ellen helpfully brought up uh, during at the end of Adi's talk, uh, the interesting fact that uh, it, uh, it, it, it seems as if, at least in certain places, the disease model of alcoholism in particular and addiction generally um, is dominant. And uh, uh, one reason I, I immediately accepted coming to this conference, besides the fact that I was already in Europe, is that uh, Hannah is the deepest and best thinker about addiction that I know in the world. And she has done uh, more good for uh, inquiry into this area and made it feel like a safe area for other philosophers like myself to work in. Now, um, I do have a, um, a sort of a special position in this field, though, because um, uh, uh, I'd like to, I write about addiction. Uh, I've wrote, written a lot of articles about addiction, but I also was alcoholic. Now, I say was alcoholic. Although people in my country who go to meetings with other people like me, I haven't had a drink in a long time, um, uh, say I am an alcoholic, no matter how. This goes back to something Adi was saying about the time element. Uh, there's a way, there's a narrative structure to the way uh, we present ourselves uh, when we talk about alcoholism. I'm going to stick to alcohol and not talk about other drugs for several reasons. One, I think the profile of specific substances and substance addictions are various. Um, they all involve different biochemistry, they work on different systems, um, um, and uh, the, as it were, the genealogy of use and the reasons we use are multifarious. Um, I will be telling you a little bit about myself though. Uh, how much I tell you about myself, you can ask me questions uh, that are personal, I may or may not answer them. It sort of depends on the looks on your face, how comfortable I feel uh, in talking about things. Uh, so I'm gonna to stick to alcohol. I'm not gonna talk about, I know about other drugs, but I'm not gonna talk about those. Um, it also avoids a kind of a general problem with uh, these kind of talks is that right now there are so many problems with drugs and actually there are so also problems with alcohol that don't have to do with the addiction side of things. For example, right now in America, there was a New York Times article last week about three young professionals who ordered um, cocaine uh, lines of coke with their uh, DoorDash. That's the thing that delivers food in New York City. Uh, and it came with fentanyl in it. And the three of them are dead. Three people the age of some of the young people in this audience. They're just dead immediately. So we have that. And you might think, oh, that's a problem with, you know, you might think it's a problem with addiction. But it has nothing to do with addiction. It just has to do, in some cases, with recreational drug users who, um, who then have this problem with fentanyl. Then there are all the different issues with prescription drugs, with the opiate crisis that was caused by um, uh, going after Maine fishermen and uh, Kentucky and West Virginia um, miners. Uh, that's a different issue. These have different ideologies. So that's just sort of background. Now, um, but I do wanna say one thing at first. You might think that uh, this is a comment about a uh, standpoint of epistemology. You might think because I am one of those people who was a heavy drinker, um, that I'm in a special position to so tell you about the nature of the phenomenon. Uh, and I'm not saying that what I'm about to say generalizes, but I do just wanna say this. I don't think I am. And part of the reason is because we've learned a certain way of speaking, even those of us who fell into the pattern of drinking addictively, we fell into a way of speaking that was dominant thanks to the um, extraordinary power of Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, its offshoots, Narcotics Anonymous, which do hold the disease model. 
And so I've been to meetings. I, by the way, respect Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous a lot. Uh, I think they, I, I think I have an idea that why they work as they, as well as they do when they do work well, which is questionable. But I don't think it has much to do with the theory that they provide of the nature of addiction. So these will be some things that will emerge. But let me first tell you a story, a story about a 12 year old boy, me. And uh, I was, uh, this is what I call the story about the boy, the hard cider and feeling not scared. Um, uh, when I was a 12 year old, eighth grade, I used to go visit a friend named Johnny Eisenfeld. Um, and uh, his parents were Jewish. Um, uh, immigrants to New York. They both worked in New York City, and uh, his house was a good house to go to uh, after school. He and I were quite on the nerdy side, and uh, he taught me a lot about the Third Reich in eighth grade, um, and he and I would sit around discussing sometimes how we would end apartheid, because we saw the connection between the Third Reich and apartheid. And one day at his house, um, I went down, it was an October day around Halloween, and I went down to his basement, where we looked at what they called in those days some girly pictures that his father had around. And we drank apple cider, hard apple cider. I drank probably a half a glass of hard apple cider. And uh, I left his house. And I was a mile and a half walk home. And I remember the way the leaves were falling for late October. And I suddenly felt different. I felt not scared. I did antecedently would have never said of myself, I was shy and timid, but I never would have said of myself, I was scared, but I just felt not that way, whatever that way was. And I knew that it was not talking about apartheid. It was not looking at the girly pictures. It was the cider. I knew then, and I knew what that drug did. I didn't immediately go out and start using alcohol at all, but I grew up in a sort of a perfect ecology for using it. First of all, my father was a Manhattan businessman. He came home every day on the six o'clock train. At 6.20 to 7.20, my parents drank martinis. Uh, I thought that everybody uh, had cocktail hour and I could tell it was a mysterious zone of life where relaxation started to occur. My dad started to be grounded again. I, we, we, I'm one of six children. We would hug my father and we would smell the liquor on his breath. But he was quite decorous. There was nothing undecorous about it. On the other hand, I knew that Flanagan's were drinkers. I also knew that from family lore. Uh, it didn't mean we were drunks. It just meant that we drank. And finally, I was a good Catholic altar boy. Therefore, every day of the week, I often had to serve morning masses, not just Sunday. I saw wine turned into God. So I was just brought up in, and, and everybody's genealogy about these things is different, but I was brought up in sort of a perfect ecology to eventually learn how to drink well. I was very good at it. Um, that's the story of the boy. And I just actually, many, many years later, that little boy, as he became a philosopher, read Wittgenstein's lecture on ethics. Wittgenstein gave this lecture on ethics in 1922 to the Heretic Society in Cambridge. And he talks, it's a very weird essay, but Wittgenstein was weird. So, uh, but he says, he's talking about three religious feelings. And this is the one, one of the feelings, one of them is wonder at the world, this wonder that anything exists and you're among them. But one is this, he says, I will mention another experience straight away, which I also know, and which others of you might be acquainted with, it is what one might call the experience of feeling absolutely safe. I mean the state of mind in which one is inclined to say, I am safe. Nothing can injure me, whatever happens. That was in the vicinity of what I felt. So what next? Well, eventually I became expert at this. I became good with some other drugs too. I knew which drugs did what. Um, I. Um, uh, I remember on my first day of philosophy class in college, my professor, brilliant guy, very large man, he was an all but dissertation at Yale. He stood up. In those days, we, you wondered what the people did in the 90s in offices. This is in the late 60s. We didn't have syllabi that were written out or sent out anywhere. Professors would say things like, buy the books, buy Plato, buy Nietzsche, buy Kierkegaard. But I remember he said, Plato posits the good. 
I was so excited, I thought I need a drink. It was just thrilling. Sometimes ideas did that to me too. So I knew different uses, but I would have gone to pot more than alcohol in those days. But you know, I just was really good at identifying the usefulness of different drugs for, for helping create different moods for me. But, and most people I knew who became like me were good at that too, okay? We knew which ones did what and how. Anyway, by, 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 um, by some time later, I became good at drinking. And uh, I did eventually, uh, not without uh, trepidation, go to Alcoholics Anonymous. And so I wanna read you here what happened by 1939 in the United States. Now this book, Alcoholics Anonymous, I think it now sells better than the Bible. I've heard that. And it's uh, translated into 39 countries. But this is one of the things it says in what's called chapter three. And I thought we would read this. I'd read this with you and then read what Fingerette says about it and make some reflections along the way about where we are now. So this is addressed to two people like me, heavy drinkers, it says this, most of us have been unwilling to admit we were real alcoholics. No person likes to think he is bodily and mentally different from his fellows. Therefore, it is not surprising that our drinking careers have been characterized by countless vain attempts to prove we could drink like other people. The idea that somehow, someday, he will control and enjoy his drinking is the great obsession of every abnormal drinker. The persistence of this illusion is astonishing. Many pursue it into the gates of insanity or death. We learned that we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholics. This is the first step in recovery. The delusion that we are like other people or presently may be has to be smashed. We alcoholics are men and women who have lost the ability to control our drinking. We know that no real alcoholic ever recovers control. All of us felt at times that we were regaining control, but such intervals usually brief were inevitably followed by still less control, which led in time to pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. We are convinced to a man that alcoholics of our type are in the grip of a progressive illness. Over any considerable period of time, we get worse, never better. Now, there's some true things in here. I don't want to underestimate the demoralization of continuing to use when you don't want to. But this has become um, ideology. And actually, you know, my main interest in this area is because I know so many people have suffered from these, this malady. Um, and I want them to get better. And I want us to have humane views that will help. And I think what everybody's been talking about here so far is good. But the question becomes, to what degree, what was behind this sort of thing? And what I can tell you truthfully is that despite this view that alcoholism is a disease, treatment in Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, et cetera, is entirely non-medical, okay? It's a bunch of peers getting around with histories of using the bad, the substance that's caused them trouble and supporting each other to stay sober, to stay sober. That's usually why people come in there. And you can start to see just sort of, without the theory being correct behind it, why it might work to have a group of people who share a similar problem to talk to without that. But anyway, this is the ideology. Now, what might be interesting to a group like this is uh, um, the, um, Alcoholics Anonymous has uh, influential psychologists and philosophers behind it. So the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, one of the two founders, Bill Wilson, claims that he got better when he was reading Varieties of Religious Experience by William James uh, while he was on Belladonna treatment at Towns Hospital. There's also in the appendix of Alcoholics Anonymous, there's a one of the early founders was a patient of Carl Gustav Jung, in uh, wherever he was in Switzerland, I believe Geneva, where Jung said he had never seen a person of this type get better unless they had a spiritual transformation. And of course, I can tell you, I mean, I'm happy I know this history too well, but you probably know that the Alcoholics Anonymous came out of perfectionist religious groups. Uh, there was a group called the Oxford Groups, not Oxford, England, but maybe they were founded there 
which were perfectionist. St. Paul in the first century thought that the world was about to end. And that's one of the reasons why he said better to, you know, not reproduce children, but get ready for the, for the final judgment day. So there were these perfectionist groups and some it's called the Oxford groups in New York. Some people got sober in those groups. So that was carried over to some of the ideology of Alcoholics Anonymous, which sometimes includes that you need to believe in a higher power and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, so that was 1939. And as I say, uh, those of us sort of who have learned about our own ailments or about the cultural problem of alcoholism often learned of it in that idiom, in that way of speaking, which is in that book. Okay, so that's important for the history of how we think about these things. Now, this philosopher Henry Fingeret comes along, this is on the next page, which is very interesting to me. He says, and this is, we'll read this passage too. So he's now writing 30, what would that be, 40, no, 50 years later. Yeah, 50 full years later. He says, what is the classic disease concept of alcoholism? First proposed in the late 1930s, it goes like this. Alcoholism is a specific disease to which some people are vulnerable. Those who are vulnerable develop the disease if they take up drinking. From apparently normal social drinking, they progress to drinking ever greater amounts, to private and secret drinking, to develop an increased tolerance to liquor, and to experiencing withdrawal distress if drinking is interrupted. They begin to have blackouts, morning after amnesia, and they forget the previous day's drinking bout. Most crucially, those afflicted by the disease inevitably progress to uncontrolled drinking because the disease produces a distinctive disability, loss of control, a loss of the power of choice in the matter of drinking. And you can see how this is carried over to in other groups to narcotics of various sorts. Now, again, there's some, um, now, so this is interesting. And uh, Hannah told me on the way over, she and I just, I told her about this book and you said you read it on the way. And it, it's pretty, it's pretty wise because what happened after that, oh, by the way, I should say, finger at ads and then discuss it throughout the rest of the book. He says, and yet no leading research authorities accept the classic disease concept. That's 1988. So that's very interesting. And he's in control, I would say, of the literature at that time. So there's one major authority on alcoholism who's doing empirical work at this time named Jelinek. He, he talks about Jelinek a lot. Jelinek has all kinds of things in his work, like describing the alcoholic profiles of people in different countries. So severe alcoholics in France, I think he says, are called gamma alcoholics. They maintenance dose all the time. American alcoholics, so just wait to the end of the day and then just get, you know, shit face. It's something like that. That's Delta alcoholism. So there was empirical work going on. What's interesting about this, though, in 1997 in America, Alan Letcher, who is the head of the National Institute of Drug Abuse, thank you, NIDA, wrote a paper uh, uh, called Addiction is a Brain Disease and It Matters. Okay. So that kind of led to. Just at the time, so we, we can sort of start to see a history here. These are hugely consequential to public health issues, to treatment modalities, to things like the law that we were just hearing about. So Lesher comes along and writes this. And so NIDA, even now, I looked it up on their website on my way over here. It says this, addiction, they're not just talking about alcoholism, it's on your handout, is defined as a chronic relapsing disorder characterized by compulsive drug seeking and use despite adverse consequences. It is considered a brain disorder because it involves functional changes to brain circuits involved in reward, stress, and self-control. Those changes may last a long time after a person has stopped taking drugs. Okay, so it's a specific disease, and in particular, it's a brain disease. Now, this is... Uh, Interesting because you know there are jokes about government work. At the same time, NIDA is doing this. We have the advance of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manuals of the American uh, Psychiatric Association, which are used in everyday clinical practice. And again, I put it on here. You'll notice that um, uh, this is DSM-5. So the definition of alcohol abuse disorder 
Um, it never mentions the brain. That's good, in my view. Um, it gives these, whatever they are, uh, nine or 10. I don't want you to read this before you go drinking because you'll feel bad. Um, <laughs> it's um, 11 criteria. Okay. And, then, and if you do go through them, I don't think I'll read them. But um, so it, it basically is considered alcohol abuse. Okay. As being mild, moderate, and severe. There's actually an amusing thing um, in the Surgeon General's report on uh, drug and alcohol abuse a few years ago. Um, uh, the Surgeon General started out by saying, we no longer use the word addiction, we use the word substance abuse because addiction was stigmatizing. And then he says, so we use substance abuse. And then by the end, he's saying some people are finding substance abuse stigmatizing, so we're using so substance misuse. And it's just kind of funny. Just call it something else. I don't know what to do. But um, <laughs> people are sensitive. But the point here is um, you can see what it gets away from in the disease model, the DSM criteria. And I think they're much more congenial for all the different disciplines that help take care of people with trouble. It says there are these are th these are just different ways you might have a relationship to a drug or alcohol. Persistent, if you have a persistent desire to cut down or control use and you're having trouble doing that, well, you check number two. Um, if you find that you're continuing to use alcohol despite having persistent or recurrent social problems or problems at work, you check that. If you end up checking like two to four of these, I think it is, you have a mild problem, uh, moderate if it's five, say, and six is six and seven, you're getting to be more severe. Now, um, uh, this seems like a humane thing to think about and propensities to the illness are never mentioned. I mean, what we do know from good, some good work, so George Valiant, this was only, a, this was all male. And by the way, that is a problem in the studies. So for example, most of the initial members of Alcoholics Anonymous were all men. Um, the first woman to join Alcoholics Anonymous was a couple of years into the organization. Um, uh, the um, uh, so sometimes we just you know we're, we're only following a certain sort of part of the group. Um, what I was going to say is that the um, when when people do studies, this whole chronic and relapsing phenomenon, um, uh, a fatal disease unless you stop it, it is true that people who go to rehab, for example, the kind that Adi was talking about, common there's 28 day programs or three month programs in America. Those don't work very well. Um, usually about three to 5% of the people who go through those are able to stay off their drug if that's what they intended. However, there's lots of other data. So for example, in George Valiant, where he's following the class of 1950 from Harvard, he's a psychiatrist. He has a nice book called The Natural History of Alcoholism. What he notices is that an awful lot of those people, and then people in subsequent years, men drank too much by their own standards and these criteria here. They were getting into trouble with their family. They were not being good fathers. They were not being good husbands. They were not being reliable at work. And they, as it's said in the literature, they matured out. Well, that's a description, not an explanation. But the usual view is that something happened where they realized they couldn't have all the things they wanted at once. And they started to, in many cases, moderate or in some cases, just stop drinking. So if you look at the natural history of the phenomenon, an awful lot of people who drink are heavy drinkers do get out of the cycle. People who do end up in rehab, so there's a, there is some serious problems there with um, uh, getting better. I'll just put it that way, and we can talk about that a little bit. Um, in any case, uh, so let me just make some, uh, I've been already making some observations along the way. So let me just, do these concluding um, reflections quickly. So what you might call problem drinking or problem drug use is like a vast category and very little of it is what you might call alcoholic. I mean, you think back and American college students, for example, love to come to college and get drunk a lot. Well, when they're drunk, they do things like have sex with someone that afterwards they didn't think is such a good idea. Um, they sometimes have sex under coercion. Uh, they sometimes get in cars. 
and uh, kill themselves or other people. They sometimes end up hospitalized for alcohol poisoning. Actually, today in a CNN headline I saw on my phone, it said that um, alcohol is the uh, eighth uh, highest cause of death of young people in the United States. But it's not alcoholic drinking, it's all the accidents and you know things like that. Um, so, uh, and it also causes, I mean, drinking can be a problem like any drug use, you know, it can cause public health problems, it causes crime and legal problems, it could cause health problems in people, again, without them drinking in a way that's uh, addictive. So this is why this, I think, spectrum idea is becoming important. And it shows where the disease model, at least the specific brain disease model, is just not plausible um, because it takes a really long time to produce whatever the changes. And there's some disagreement among people about what are the changes, where they occur. Some people think it's a midbrain mutiny. Some people think it's a dopaminergic problem. Some people think it's an opiate problem. Some people think it's an overlearning system. I mean, there's a whole bunch of different views. But um, almost no one is treating that or even trying to treat that. Um, country, race, ethnic, and gender variation across every dimension. Country with the highest um, alcoholism rate, it's hard to get data on this, but I'm just reporting, um, is Russia. One in five men have a moderate to a serious. Women, women only about three to 5%. Uh, almost all the, the former Soviet countries are high but America and UK appear in the top 10 or so list, uh, FYI. Um, and there are, of course, for a whole spectrum of drugs, including alcohol, lots of variation in which ethnic groups prefer them. I mean, again, my people, I was taught Flanagan's dream, okay? Other people use different substances. Um, the, um, uh, Hannah will probably talk about this, or maybe not, but she's written a lot of beautiful work on this. It's very, very common uh, to see dual diagnoses. So, um, and some of these things that people are diagnosed with like personality disorders or bipolar disorder or anxiety disorders, they're not specific brain diseases or specific diseases of any particular sort. Um, and then so far, so there's lots of comorbidity we might say, and that, that creates a real challenge. So you'll see, um, you know, one, one might think that, okay, this is a person who has a problem with drinking. Well, they often have like other things and you can see if you take the kind of view that I think I'm trying to push here, because I was trying to introduce you to a sort of a form of life that I was introduced to that just made it sanctioned that I drink. And by the way, what Dal Dalian finds out is he says he can't find any personality trait, which is highly predictive of becoming a heavy drinker, but he does find that in ethnic groups where there's joking about um, uh, adult foolish behavior um, uh, and permission is given you get more alcoholics in that group. But they say things like my father used to say, oh, Mr. Fogarty, he's on the wagon again. He crashed into the fucking you know, door of the garage. You joke about it, the next thing you know, the kids are laughing and you get the idea. Um, uh, the, the one thing, so a, and the other thing that my, my opening story tried to indicate is the heterogeneity of motives that people go into start their drinking or drug use careers. Um, and I told you, I, I knew it would, would make me feel safer. Uh, but other of us go into it for fun. I also noticed that girls seem to like me more after the first drink, but not after maybe two or three more. Um, uh, there's excitement, there's anxiety reduction, there's social awkwardness, conviviality, and there's just that everybody's doing it. All these things are reasons why people take drugs and alcohol. There's also a lot of confusion about the phenomenon of craving. So some people think that there's an irresistible craving. I know about craving, but there's two different kinds of craving. There's the craving of someone who's a heavy drinker when they want the good feeling that that substance produces. And sometimes that occurs on a clock, like five o'clock, a thirst develops. Sometimes it's there a lot, all the time. But there's another kind of craving that should be distinguished. It's just withdrawal craving. So sometimes you probably know this, that alcohol withdrawal is the most dangerous of all the drug withdrawals. It's about the only one you can die from. Um, and uh, you have seizures and DTs and so on and so forth. Well, um, uh, every alcoholic knows when the alcohol has stopped working for them, that when they wake up without it, even though they swore off drinking the day before, they go into terrible, terrible withdrawal symptoms. And they know that there's, as far as they have, one and only one thing that will 
uh, stop the, the craving, the, the, the withdrawal craving, and that's drinking more. Okay, so that's a vicious cycle. So we need humane treatments of that. And this is where um, uh, my last two comments here, um, I'm not gonna be able to talk about shame and guilt or maybe in the question period, but clearly drugs are, are, can be very useful and are sometimes necessary for severe withdrawal. So almost every medical person knows you give benzos to people who are trying to get off alcohol because uh, you want to, well. And then there's also uh, naltrexone now, there are other drugs for cocaine, uh, which help reduce the pleasant effects of drinking if you do go back and drink. Um, but this relates to the comorbidity issue. Almost all the best treatments for, the, for cases of comorbidity involve things um, uh, like CBT that we heard about today, motivational interviewing, group support. They're entirely non-medical. Non in the cases though of cohort, or, I'm sorry, but in the cases, this is on the, the last uh, page, the best treatments for the cohort morbid cases do often involve drugs. So you need to treat, maybe not in the case of personality disorders, those are the hard ones and other people can speak wisely about them. But for example, people who have bipolar disorder need to have the bipolar treated because bipolar is one of the ones with the highest rates of alcoholism really, really high rates. And you treat the bipolar, you're not treating the brain, alleged brain disease, which is the alcoholism, you're treating the bipolar in order to treat one of the many, many different causes. It's a multi-causal thing that is contributing to the probability that the person drinks more, or if it's a depression, you get them SSRIs or so on and so forth for each kind of anxiety disorder. But notice in all these cases, you're using hybrid techniques of a whole bunch of sorts. None of them are treating an alleged underlying brain disease. Um, I'll leave to um, discussion or tomorrow discussion about legitimacy of shame and guilt and bringing up some of the things Adi talked about, about responsibility or ability to control. But I hope you can see that I do think that uh, it takes it, it, it. It's not an individualistic thing to get through the difficult times of addiction, as I understand it. But um, uh, there's a lot of things that we can do, and a lot of knowledge out there that people like you in this room have to help compassionately heavy drinkers. Thank you. So we have again the one thing very uh cool. I figured it's not very well. Um but yeah, we'll have some questions in one or two. Okay. That's a good technique to use get people in and out and it also helps people actually formulate a question sometimes. I have a friend once who uh, went to Quaker meetings, you know, mm -hmm. where those were like everybody's tired of meeting and then you pay them yeah. to sit. So she said to a friend of hers who was going to a bad night, I feel that she said, yeah. I think you enjoy Quaker meetings. I'm going to Quaker, first Quaker meeting. And uh, you know, the person in charge said, you never like to sleep in this new person who's still having to take notes. The spirit really came to us. Yeah. The spirit really came quickly. <laughs> Yeah, you have many. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, something like 80% of the people in the world fit now criteria that are in there, though. So you you are you know, one or more psychiatric diseases. Yeah. yeah. But I think I think what's good about the DSM one, the DSM five criteria, though, is they're just they're pretty commonsensical, and you can see how once these things start to cluster, you're on some spectrum. Of that. You know that? So you think something else is. I don't know. I'm, 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 I'm,
I so much better for the approach, but I hope I'm able to select the thoughts and questions you might have. And so we're going to have the same system as we have all day, which is if you have a substantive new question, please put your hand up like this. If you have a follow up from the substantive question that has to be, please put a finger like this. Uh, and for anyone online, either type your question or raise your hand and I'll come to you. Question to you. Okay, you are quick to mark. Perhaps, sorry. This is about something you said very early on, perhaps quite sort of incidental, but you used this phrase, drink well. You said that you learned to drink well. You were in a, an ecology that taught you to drink well. And I have used this phrase, I think in very different contexts, in very different ways before, but without me saying how I've used it, could you perhaps say sort of what you meant by drink? What is it to drink well? And why is that relevant? Um, well, my sense of drinking well, uh, I think there's a, uh, my sense of drinking well was I became summa cum laude at drinking large amounts of alcohol, but also scheduling how I did it such that I would pass for a very long time of my life a uh, people would view me as a high, most people wouldn't know that I was a high functioning alcoholic. I guess I would put it that way. Um, that didn't last forever. It's hard to sustain that um, because eventually um, I needed, I, I had strong physiological need to do something like you would call maintenance dosing. Um, and uh, so when I, it's uh, my tongue is in my cheek when I said I learned to drink well. I think there are many, many people in the world who drink well. Um, I think that um, uh, many people know how to drink. Many, I'm not judgmental about other people drinking, but I know that for someone like me, uh, it almost ruined my life because I wasn't able to do other things I value much more um, due to the difficulty I had controlling it. But I never had irresistible. I mean, one thing about these definitions about the disease model is there's discussion of irresistible impulses. I mean, it didn't take Gene Heyman's book, although that's a good book. What is it called? Addiction by choice. Yeah, addiction disorder of choice. I mean, he talks about just one sort of obvious thing, namely that all addicts of various sorts schedule their desires like you just it's not you know you just don't take out a needle to do your drug in public you'll schedule it till you go to the bathroom break or alcoholics do that too we schedule all the time you obsess sometimes about scheduling but you resist doing it in lots of different environments so that part alone is well known that kind of yeah is that responsive at all yeah I was saying follow-ups, and I think I'm just going to go to Hannah and then I'll do follow-ups. Okay, great. Okay. Um, so, Owen, I had a similar question, and although I, I, I guess I wanted, I've wondered whether, because because in the work I've the work I've done on drug addiction as opposed to alcohol addiction, a lot of the ways in which people talk about, you know, being a good junkie is much more connected to identity and community than what you just described. But yet that was a really big part of, so is that, a, is that part of it too? Yeah. Okay. Good. And thank you for elaborating on that. Yeah. And, and Hannah gave me like, that's, that's what you like a friend to give you. I've written a lot about this sort of identity and community thing. I, I never heard that there was a thing called alcoholism. I swear, I, I was in a poetry class in first year of college and someone used the word sop. I said, what is that? And they said, a drunk. I said, I never heard about that. Um, I, uh, uh, yeah, so I, I lived in communities of, I either identified with Irish drinking a lot, or I sometimes, when I sort of thought that some of the Irish American people I knew didn't drink that sort of decorously, I would think about the group of people who were at the Algonquin Hotel with Dorothy Parker and other artists and writers. And I would be part of those people who would drink martinis at lunch, things like that. I still have a fantasy. I shouldn't tell you this, but 
I still have a fantasy that one day when the doctor tells me like I have six months to live, I hope they do it that way, that I'll, I'll drink like a gentleman for six months. Because I think there is something beautiful and glamorous about that. I still, again, the identity constituent parts of it. I don't have this much anymore, but when I would walk into a nice restaurant 15 years ago and see a young couple drinking fine wine, I think, yeah, that's, that's, what, that's part of what love's about. I would make, I've had, it was built, a worldview was built for that. So for a while, I was quite good at doing it decorously, successfully, as professionally moving along. People sometimes ask me, because I've written a lot of books, they say, which years were you drunk? I said, I'm not telling. <laughs> um, so I think we're going to have a microphone bit some people up for the Oh, I said the finger, I'm never going to go to Ellen. Sorry. So the question then, if you said you got good at it and you still were highly functioning, where was the tipping point? Or as in, of course, there wasn't probably, but when could you feel you were on the slippery slope and that you needed, or maybe not you personally, but when does it become unprofessional or, um, well, you know what I mean? No, thank you. Um, well, I could sort of, Say, I mean, I guess what one finds, this reminds me of Adi's talk, because I've been around, I've heard thousands of people like me tell their stories. So it's just various, you'd be surprised. There are some people whose jobs just don't allow them to show up with a hangover. There are some people um, who start to get physical ailments. You know, they go to a doctor and the doctor says, your liver enzymes are elevated. Um, there are people, there are many, many cases where one's family life, personal life, isn't going well. This is why I think the motivational interviewing um, work is so important because one, sometimes what you need in the sort of confusional disorder that is a person using a lot of drugs or alcohol and you, your life isn't going well, you're trying to sort of figure out, you know, you have, you have to sort of, it's not a spiritual awakening quite, but you have to realize that each of us cares about living a meaningful, successful human life in the flourishing sense. And if you start to see that one aspect of your behavior is sort of bringing a lot of other parts down. Um, uh, I did once uh, stop drinking, not because I thought that I had a problem, but when my kid brother died in a solo drunk driving accident, I um, said to my other brother, um, who was already off drugs and alcohol, I think I should give up drinking for my children because drinking causes trouble in our family. Some people talk about denial, you know, I don't know. I mean, but it, it just took, it took, you know, to sort of figure out that you weren't, everything in my life wasn't sort of going the way I wanted. Plus, you feel like shit sometimes, too. Uh, great. Thanks, Ellen. That's a, that's a really, it's a great talk. And thank you for sharing so much about your own history. Um, so I want to go back to safety, that feeling of safety, and relate it to sort of the choices that I think often are the choices between behavior, symptoms, brain, neurobiology. And those, you know, of course, go back to mind body, do, you know, we, we kind of separate it um, along those lines. And I guess one of the things that I don't hear, I haven't heard you talk about, and often people don't talk about is sort of the psychological or the affective component as being a real possibility for really understanding whether it's alcohol use disorder or, or other substance use disorders. And one of the things that really strikes me both about, al well, we'll stay with alcohol, is that it's an analgesic, right? About what else? It, it's a pain reliever. It's an analgesic, yeah, right? So yeah. in the, in, in thinking about that sense of, I felt safe. Yeah. yeah. I didn't feel, even if I didn't know this no, thing yeah, yeah, yeah. was bothering me, it was relieved. And, and I wonder if you have thoughts just about that role that alcohol, and of course, 
opiates play the same. Yeah, and yeah. as you, I, I appreciated that not all drugs yeah, do this, yeah, yeah, but yeah. specifically. Well, yeah. no, uh, thank you for the, for the question. Yeah, I, I mean, I tell the story about, thank you, uh, the feeling I had with that first, and I swear it was the tiniest bit. I mean, but you know, that does it to a little kid. I mean, it was just a, a small lab, you know, so it, uh, I felt, so the, un, the, the not feeling scared. Um, uh, I don't know if it was just me, but most people I've met who end up in rehabs or hospitals or the rooms that I sometimes go to, and we go to them for different reasons. Like I, I once went, uh, we'll see, this will be addressing the question, but um, soon after I got sober, I went to a, um, I had a surgery for hernia. And so I went to some NA meetings because all the people in that Narcotics Anonymous, they believe the same stuff. And by the way, many people in Alcoholics Anonymous because of cross addictions, introduce themselves as I'm an alcoholic and an addict. Just, um, they have different experiences with different drugs. And most people in Narcotics Anonymous, for example, have had to have surgery. And often they are given the very drug that they wanted to stop, like opiates, right? So if heroin, they're very helpful there. You know, and they gave me a lot of tips about what to tell the doctor. I said to the doctor, that was one set of drugs I didn't like ever. I tried everything. Um, uh, I didn't like opiates, but I thought I'm good at getting good at any drug. <laughs> and usually because I knew the effects. But I compare it to probably most of you know how to do this. You, you, you know what music you like to listen to to change your mood and affect. You know, if I want to sort of think about, I don't know, I, I'll listen to a foray requiem, say, and I, that puts me in a different space than Rolling Stones. You know, I just, I, I just know how to do that with music, on my, and I do it all the time. So I just knew the same thing with drugs, and I love the feeling of feeling safe. Um, there were other feelings I loved. You know, sometimes I had to learn to, um, uh, sometimes maybe maybe a lot of us had this sort of occupational hazard. Uh, like um, some ideas get me so excited, I want to stop them. Like Plato Plaza for good. If I get really interested in something, I'm just always interested in things. They can, I need some, I feel like I need something. And I knew from an early age, you know, what Valium was good for, what Belladonna was good for, what marijuana was good for, they were all addressed to very different experiences. But a lot of people I met are like me in that regard. So that's the aspect of knowing how to regulate emotions. We have so many questions. Um, I'll shorten my answers. I, that's not, that was not what I was asking for, but just to say, uh, everyone's cognizant of it. Um, I might just I'll be good, by the way, at the pub answering questions. You'll be less good asking questions than I will answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think my question might be short. I actually had a quick thought as you were talking. Like, I wonder if some of this is also generational because some of my older friends also talk about drugs and this tweaking mood in this way, which like I find fascinating. Um, so I think there's some kind of like generational knowledge there. Uh, my question was just, I wanted to know, I guess, because you described something like CBT as non-medical, and I wanted to know, I, I guess, where you see the boundary, because, like, I find that a lot of, so especially younger CBT practitioners, I think they do think of what they do in medical terms, and I find that really fascinating. So, yeah, and, you know, you get doctors prescribing walks now, so. I that was, yeah, yeah, no, that was just, as uh, referring to CBT, did I do, uh, I guess I I, um, I understand the question. I don't want it to be semantic. I guess it was um, just suggesting that the brain disease, you would think that if you're specified, I mean, take diabetes, okay? Actually, now that I chose that example, I don't know what it is. Is it pancreatic insulin producing? Just pancreatic, I got a doctor. Yeah, so it's a disease of the pancreas, you might say. Now, diabetes actually is interesting in several ways because type 2 diabetes, uh, the person participates in her own either getting worse or getting better. But 
Um, but it's a pancreatic disease, and I take it that it gives something that like helps the pancreas do whatever they're supposed to do to produce the insulin uh, or sidestep it. So you'd expect that there's, from 1998 on, the head of the NIDA, National Institute of Drug Abuse, well, it, it, as long, you know, why, you know, they say, well, there's a brain disease. I say, well, give me that brain drug that stops the disease. But no one ever gives that. They give it for, at the most, the medic, what I was referring to was giving it for bipolar disorder or, you know, whatever, uh, anxiety disorder or depression. Those are the comorbid features, and you get drugs for those. That's all I meant. Yeah. Is that a follow-up on this? Yeah. yeah. Kind of follow up. So basically, uh, I don't want to ask a very personal question, but from what I can hear, like since the beginning of your early uh, age, so you were 12 when you started drink drinking cider, and it feel it felt like you so drink as a safety safety place. And my question is, because normally when we are lacking some other aspects in our life, then we resort to something to give us that same feeling. So to me, it feels like maybe there was something happening in your life, maybe kind of personal, I don't know. I, I just, I'm just curious, what happened in your life that you felt like you were not safe? Oh, that is much, uh, the question was, what happened in my life that I felt like that's way beyond my pay grade. All I was trying to do, I actually claim that I felt very loved. I had very wonderful parents. I had five wonderful siblings. I didn't feel, there was nothing out of the ordinary. I was young and small. I was a year younger than everybody else in school. I wasn't really smaller. I was just on the shy side. I think that there's, all I want to use that example for is it's purely illustrative of a perfectly normal, healthy 12 year old boy who had an effect from taking a substance that I liked and I could identify it. I think there's nothing, particularly deep about it um, at all. But thank you for asking. I hope there isn't because it's too late for me to figure that out. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> I'm gonna hand over to Hannah. Okay. Part of what I love with, about your work, and it's just come out of two questions, is the way you talk, not just about the way drugs relieve suffering, but about the way they bring like pleasure and joy and exciting experiences. And what's just occurred to me, and of course, we find that much harder to deal with as a society. It's much easier to be accepting if there's suffering that drug, drugs are alleviating as opposed yeah. to something positive that they're genuinely yeah. doing. Yeah. Anyway, it's just a thought that safety kind of invites the idea that you are unsafe. But yeah. actually, I don't know if you mean it yeah. that way. Yeah. Right. Yes, I didn't mean that. I didn't intend that. That's sort of how, yeah. Right. So maybe there's something about the Wittgenstein quote, which although it spoke to you is a little misleading because it's like I was sort of, we all know he yeah. wasn't safe yeah. in a fundamental way. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. I purely wanted to point to like that was almost a, it was just lovely that I felt that way. Yeah. It was just a lovely experience. Yeah. That's a nice that's my thought. No, I like that one. <laughs> Let's go. Can I ask Bennett to go next and unmute yourself if you're able to, and then we'll come back to the room. Um, uh, can you hear me? Is this yeah. working? Yeah. All right. Um, thanks very much for the talk. I I wanted to ask about like a kind of throwaway comment you made at the very beginning about the, the standpoint epistemology comment, because I kept thinking about that, especially in relation to uh, AA and NA, because as I'm sure you know, like one on most iterations of standpoint epistemology, one doesn't get the critical standpoint for free. Like it's an achievement. You have to do this work to, to achieve it. And it seems like some people like might think that like going to AA and NA is doing that work. Like, like, you know, gathering in a group, reflecting on your experience. But it seemed like what you were saying was that actually it could be undermining that because you sort of you go to AA NA and you take on the sort of simplistic disease model. As, as a result of that. And that might undermine your ability to like critically reflect in this way. So I just wanted to invite you to say more about that because I thought that was fascinating. Right. So thank you for that. Yes, uh, that's exactly what I, what I think. I mean, you know, there, right. And you, you, you expressed this nicely. I mean, there's, there's one sort of strand of standpoint epistemology, which just asserts something like this. You can't know what it is like unless you live in my shoes and I can tell you more about what it's like and uh, as a individual of a certain sort. And then 
So what, um, what I, my suggestion is, is that alcoholics are really, really good at telling you some things about their specific problems that they had, going back to the earlier question, sort of what wasn't going well in their life. They can almost always tell you that, okay? Uh, whether it was you know, a relationship or their health or a whole bunch of things. They can usually tell you that. If you start to ask them about the nature of the problem they had, there's a lot of talk about things like you had a hole in your soul. That's one thing that people say all the time. Another thing is to say, which, oh, this really struck me as amusing, that you're taught in the big book that people with problems with drinking have an allergy to alcohol. I say, no, 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 it's the opposite. <laughs> you want it all the time. It's just funny. So there's a lot of stuff like that, you know? Uh, you tell it, yeah, you tell a heroin addict, you have an allergy to heroin. Well, what is that? I mean, so there's a lot of stuff, but a lot of it in there is about this meeting for a spiritual awakening. There, it's a lot of ideology about, that's a combination of Christian perfectionist beliefs uh, the need for belief in higher power, the belief in the allergy, but the belief in the disease model is just part of it. So everybody says all the time at meetings, no matter where you go in the world, I've been to meetings on six continents um, and they say the same things, but it's all from the book. Uh, and it's about disease, holes in your soul, things like that. that so thank you. That Yeah, that, that was my idea of what, sort of has infiltrated public thinking. And if you accept standpoint epistemology, then you might say something like, well, let's not us, you know, doctors at NIDA decide that it's a brain disease. Let's listen to the alcoholics. And the alcoholics will tell you that it's a disease. So it's a perfect, you know, they come together beautifully, but it's not true probably. Great, okay. I think I'm gonna go to the so uh, a one sentence question, were you disabled? I thought Adi gave us a lot to think about. Uh, I just think that's a real, and, and by the way, I, I wouldn't expect, you know, what am I, uh, I could have said this at the beginning of the talk and you'll see how it applies. When I used to do straight arrow philosophy of mind, I used to always say the answer to any complicated philosophical question about mind requires us first pass to take seriously phenomenology, psychology, neuroscience, and probably if it's a social aspect of mind, sociology, anthropology, everything else. I'd say the same thing here. We shouldn't, ex and, and there, you know, the question is, you know, you might say, well, what, they don't always, they're not always consistent. I say, right, then you just got to be patient and sort of keep talking among the disciplines, but they're all gonna be helpful because to be sure, there often are in, in for extreme cases of sub alcohol substance abuse, there are known to be changes in the body, in the brain. I mean, let's just accept that. Um, and, but some of the earlier cases, there are no brain changes. And then, so what sort of neuroscience can contribute is limited. What social psychology can contribute is limited. What phenomenology, first person reports can contribute is limited uh, and how they all, intersect with practical requirements like what the law should say about the phenomenon. I just think these are very, very uh, puzzling. I, I do, uh, you know, from what I said in, in response to Adi's talk was that, you know, these are puzzling cases because I don't know what you're, you know, we're taught things like this and I think it's sensible. Many of the partners of say alcoholics are told and rightly so that you need to walk. You know, you can't, you can say, oh, my husband's disabled and I, you know, and, and here I am for him. No, sometimes you just got to walk. Sometimes you got to lose jobs because there's safety issues. I mean, so the, the whole issue of humane treatment on the legal, you know, side and in jobs, I think is very complicated. Uh, that Those are different questions than what the phenomena is or what kind of cluster phenomena or syndrome uh, these things are different questions. Well, thank you. Sorry, uh, the comments. There was another question, and then if we have time, I'll come to your question. 
maybe two questions that a bit contradict each other. So the first is goes back to when you said it's you were a high functioning well drinker. Yeah. Um, to what extent is drinking performance enhancing? So sustainable over days or months and so on and still well functioning and the second question intention intention with the first is why on earth is this stuff socially acceptable so if this is such a drug that can have this damaging effect then why do we we ban most other drugs alcohol we accept in most countries yeah. why okay so let me the, the two questions the first question is uh, I said I was high functioning uh, drinker. Uh, and the question, first question was, well, is alcohol a performance enhancer? Um, uh, probably not, <laughs> not the way I used it. Um, uh, but uh, like a lot of people, I did think I was better striking up conversations as a young man, you know, being comfortable in social situations with a little drink in my, in me. Um, and, uh, and, and I believe that was true. Uh, a friend, a mutual friend of uh, Hannah and mine, uh, Carl Hart, who's uh, a, a drug expert at Columbia, he's a neuroscientist and psychologist. I believe that he has tested every single drug you can imagine, street drug and non-street drug. So certainly nicotine is a performance enhancer at low doses. Um, I believe he's tested uh, cocaine, uh, amphetamines, he, Every, almost every drug on um, the kind of things you need to study in college will help you if you take it in the right dose. So that's, I don't think alcohol is on the list. Um, I think it helps you function yeah. yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, okay, that, that, that would be, yeah. Yeah, 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 right. So, so that's an interesting point about drugs being performance enhancing. Probably at low doses, almost everything is in certain domains is the answer, but not at the, not at the levels that most addicts end up using it. It's almost always counterproductive. Uh, the second question is why do we um, allow it? Well, one answer is that we shouldn't overestimate the number of people who become addicted in the strongest possible sense. Most of the public health problems, not most, I shouldn't say this, I have no idea about the number, but if you just think back to things like reg regrettable sexual relations, um, uh, saying really stupid things, um, getting in car accidents, falling down and ending up the hospital because you broke your wrist or your, all those things are not caused by addiction. They're just like people drinking too much and those things are, you know. So, and it might well be that a harm reduction approach, which is what I favor about most of these things, would take into account that you should have a lot more public health information. I mean, one thing, for example, that people, I've been told this is true in America, um, Apparently, you get, if you put up in dormitories and colleges, information that if your average size boy drinks three beers, he's over the blood alcohol level. And if a girl drinks maybe two, he's over. You put up posters in dormitories, that has some good effect. I never knew anything like that back in my day that, you know. Um, so there are public health interventions that you could do to help with the, uh, you know, provision. yeah, I guess, is that, a, is that a responsive to your second part of your question? Why don't we do more about it? Yeah, yeah, because you could say to young people generally, you will probably be a jerk during this age time, especially if you go away to a residential college, you would, but you should know certain things about the kind of things that can lead to, including, that is number eight on the list of causes of death for people in your age group. Well, I mean, the question is, if you have all the car accidents and all the other problems, then what is the sad? I guess I, I just would never think that. We have some good answers here in the event. Yeah. yeah. 
And I, I think it's a social addiction in that we have uh, we have historically tried to to ban alcohol at least in the United States uh, in, from the 20s to the early 30s, and it created disaster, probably more so than uh, socially legalizing alcohol. And, and another example of that, uh, uh, so I, I work and live in Denver, Colorado, and uh, when, when uh, COVID came, uh, and there was going to be uh, lockdown, and you know there were you know essentially only uh, facilities that were required could stay open. Uh, Denver initially said liquor stores were going to close, and uh, there was revolt. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not, not only that, there were there was run on the liquor stores, and they had you know crime control issues in that. So. <laughs> America, American history, American history is so that you tell us a lot about the question that you yeah. ask and you ask that you're right going to get. For the sake of time, I only want to ask for one more question, which is your, um, from you, I'm going to, and then you're running for a bit, but then we can do it. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to hear a little bit more about the maturing out phenomenon and particularly how it relates to the sorts of motivations people have for their... Good for their substance abuse disorders. Some of the motivations on your list are clearly the sorts of things that you might age out of, like, you know, particular kinds of uh, pursuit of fun. Yeah. But other things, maybe not so much, like shyness or like feeling socially awkward. Maybe, yeah. maybe not. Yeah. That's it. Good. No, that's a, um, a great question. Um, and, and I'll just speak from what little I know about, like, I read a, a fair amount about this because let me again emphasize the, what people try to figure out, one of the many things is a puzzle, and you can see it in the AA description of addiction and also in the thing finger at folks in 1988 is the thing. It basically describes alcohol addiction as a fatal, a chronic uh, uh, relapsing fatal disease. Unless you stop it, that's where the abstinence movement, you know, abstinence is the only answer in that model. Uh, and, and in fact, when I first went to a very good doctor who, after I had been, you know, many years, I, a new doctor, and she said, I'm so glad to hear that you're in remission. And I thought, it was interesting, you know? I mean, but it's the way we all try to work with these concepts. Um, and um, so what is interesting about the, um, the data, a lot of the data that some people were dealing with was people with severe problems and what's the rate at which they're able to really stop? And again, back to like people who go into rehabs, it's very low rates. But the question was, are we not watching whole other big swaths of the population? So that's where the maturing out data became interesting. And I think we don't know to what degree they were sort of on the severe side, but enough of them described themselves in ways that you might think were moderate or severe. Um, they almost always were described as, in some sense, you know, being mature enough to have a view of a good human life, where there was something like, you know, love, work, raising children, helping the next generation to grow. And their drinking was probably called out, because these were the men of Harvard class of 1950 on, by women in their life um, for their failures. To meet up with their responsibilities. It could have also been happening at work because if those of you who watch like shows like Mad Men or things like that, you know that there was times in sort of you know energetic Wall Street or you know mid Manhattan culture. There was the two martini lunches. Maybe bosses were sometimes calling people out. But the overall description of the so-called mature out was usually because they were not they were not harmonizing all the ends of their life. Now, um, yeah, some of those other, I don't know about exploration of those other things. I mean, of course we do know that there's lots of drugs taken by people now. So maybe the same people who are maturing out were going on SSRIs for anxiety or benzos. Sure, we're going on benzos in my time, mother's little helper. Um, we had it all, yeah. <laughs>
I know. And on that note, let's be friendly with each other. Thank you very much.